Hi, Renee. Welcome to the Arthritis Life Podcast. Thank you for having me, Cheryl. So can you start off by just telling the audience a little bit about yourself and your relationship to arthritis? Sure. So I'm Renee. Um, I am married for, I've been married for 17 years to my husband. Uh, We have three kiddos, uh, ages 10, 8, and 6. We live in West Michigan, Uh, love going to the beach on a regular basis. And yeah, I was diagnosed with RA in late 2017. And right after my diagnosis, I started my Instagram account, the Rheumatoid Arthritis Mama. And it's just grown into what it is today. And that's how we met. I actually love the fact that we connected um, through Instagram. The reason that I found you was because of your super fun reels and your awesome um, smile and your positivity and just um, your way to educate people and make them smile at the same time. So that's so sweet. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you on here. And I love that social media has connected so many of us with these diseases. It wasn't around when I got diagnosed in 2003. So I feel lucky that it's here now. Yeah, I'm just super excited to be here and chat today. My diagnosis story, my official diagnosis was in 2017. But I had been experiencing a lot of mystery symptoms for over a decade that went undiagnosed. And I know that that's pretty common with people with autoimmune diseases, it kind of you know, snowballs in a way, you know, where it starts out as little things and then it gets bigger and bigger until you finally can get to that definitive diagnosis. And that was definitely me. Um, I had experienced things starting all the way back in um, when I was a teenager. And then I was officially diagnosed when I was 37. So it's just been um, over three years since my diagnosis. And my my RA, my actual RA symptoms happened after the birth of my first child. And he's now um, going to be 10 next month. And it just started with some wrist pain, you know, which is pretty typical. I went to the doctor after he was about six months old. And I was like, this is really hurting me. And my doctor said, well, it's probably de vein syndrome, which is like new mom's wrist. Um, and they said, we can't do anything for you. We can give you a little steroid shot, but that's all we can do. So have a nice life. And then after that, it was just, you know, this progression of joint pain. And with every pregnancy, the joint pain got worse and worse. And then um, after I finished breastfeeding my third daughter, and she turned two, then it was like in heightened um, mode. And then I got diagnosed that fall. So um, it really was for me very, I think the hormones of having three babies in four years was definitely a factor that kind of threw my body into um, the major, major flare that finally ended with my diagnosis. So, so I'm curious how um, emotionally, what was your response when you got your diagnosis? Yeah. So when I was first diagnosed because my husband was really the one that was pushing me for the diagnosis. He's like, you, you, it, because I was getting to the point where I couldn't buckle my kids into their car seats. I couldn't zip up their zippers. I couldn't button their buttons. We were living in a home with um, hardwood hickory floors at the time. And I could not put my bare feet on the floor um, without excruciating pain. And I was almost bedridden to the point where my husband was having to you know, stay home from work and work from home more and help me take care of the kids, like help me get dressed, help me do all these things that for a long time I had taken for granted. And so for me, it was him really pushing me toward that diagnosis. And then, so first I went to my, you know, primary care physician and they did some blood work. Um, And then I also started seeing a functional medicine doctor at the same time. So, and they were the one that said, you have something autoimmune going on. Um, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but you should probably get this checked out. And that's, and and it ended up being the RA. And so uh, my initial reaction to it was, I was really fearful. I was really scared. I didn't know anyone outside the geriatric community that had rheumatoid arthritis. You know, I had a grandmother that I, um, we know from my youth that had really crippled up fingers from arthritis. And that was really my only experience with arthritis was my little Romanian grandma with her crippled fingers. And I was like, is that going to be me? You know, I, I have a brand, you know, I have a brand new family and 
I'm young and this, this is totally out of my repertoire of, you know, understanding. And so I was really scared. Um, I was also relieved though, too. And I'm sure you've talked to people with that experience that after a decade of not knowing what was wrong with me, I finally had a definitive answer. Um, and I had dealt with years of other issues. You know, I dealt with, you know, insulin resistance and polycystic ovarian syndrome, you know, infertility. Um, I had my gallbladder removed, you know, I had all these things. So it was like, finally, this progression up to this, like, you know, this, this diagnosis. And it was really scary. I was like, am I going to die? You know, is this going to, is this, you know, am, is, am I, is this a death sentence? That was a big, that was a big thing for me. That mixture of emotions you described is so common because on the one hand, so many of us have, have been told by various medical professionals, like you were when your first child was six months old, oh, it's just this, it's just that it's the younger, the even younger than us people get told, oh, it's just growing pains, you know, your knee hurts because it's growing pains or, and again, hindsight's twenty twenty. it's not to say that every doctor like 100% should have known, but there's a feeling a lot of times with autoimmune diseases that we get kind of dismissed and especially women. Like I was told, you're just anxious. You're just anxious. Yeah. I was put on, I was told I had anxiety and depression Yeah, and same thing. I mean, I was in and out of specialists for over a decade, Cheryl, Mm. and it was very exhausting, but you know, your body and you know, when there's something wrong and just off. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you got that diagnosis. And yeah, I think I'm always like relating things back to occupational therapy. I just have to say too, that like, we really, as occupational therapists have to do a better job promoting our profession to primary care doctors and others, because like with Duquerre veins, there are things you could do. Like you could have gotten a referral to a certified hand therapist yeah. to get a splint, or you could have gotten a, a, like three or four sessions of occupational therapy to specifically walk you through and day in your life. How are we going to get the kid in and out of the car seat? Can we use an adaptive gadget? Like you should not have had to figure that out on your own, even without a diagnosis. My heart just goes out to all the undiagnosed people. Cause we know that just as we suffered unnecessarily before our diagnoses, there's others right now who are suffering too. Um, but I'm sure the audience is going to want to know a little bit more now about, um, what has your journey parenting three children now while balancing your rheumatoid arthritis? Sure. So yeah, my kids, like I said, my, my youngest was two when I got my diagnosis. And so my kids have very much grown up with a mom that has been sensitive to, you know, pain, or they've been acutely aware of mommy has arthritis, you know, mommy's got RA. And this word is very, very normal to them now. And so, uh, because of that, I feel like they have a sensitivity and more of a compassion toward being a little bit more lenient and understanding like when plans have to change because mommy's in a flare or mommy can't do that physical thing or can't take them somewhere because I'm, I need to rest, you know, prioritizing rest is so important for RA patients. And, and it's come with some disappointment sometimes for them. Um, and when I, when I have to rest, I rest, but when I can play hard, we can play hard. And it's also helped them to, um, really get an understanding of other people's it's, it's, it's the world is bigger than just what's inside their bubble, you know? And that's why I said it, it's really helped them with that compassion piece. So for us and our family, that's been really important. And having a supportive husband has been, has been huge in that too you know, just saying, you know, mommy's resting. So now you're, they're going to go do something special or whatever. Um, But it's been hard. I mean, it's not easy being able to, it's hard to let your kids down sometimes, but that's a reality of it. Um, So, so yeah, that's kind of where, where I'm at right now, I guess, but in the early stages of it, um, I feel like for me, I was really trying to hide it from them. I really was. And when I was really in the height of right before pre-diagnosis, I really was trying to be tough and trying to be prideful in a way, you know, everything's fine. Um, But realizing very soon after my diagnosis that I needed to be open with them and honest with them and with my husband and share what's going on 
And, and that has really been good for us as a family too. That's, that's so important. And that's definitely a stage a lot of people go through. And I'm sure a lot of people will wonder, how did you start those conversations with your children? And did you start, did you talk about it differently to the older one than the younger ones? Yeah, sure. So um, I remember when we were, when I was first diagnosed, I, I sat them down and I said, you know, mommy has, mommy has something called rheumatoid arthritis. And we practice saying it rheumatoid arthritis. And I, and, and I said, it's, it's, it's something that mommy's going to have forever. And it's something that mommy is going to have to deal with. And it causes me a lot of pain. So um, when, you know, sometimes mommy is going to need help with certain things. So, and they've really stepped up in that regard, you know, having them empowering them, you know, in a way to say, you know, I'm doing this for mom because she, she needs some extra help here and there, whether it's lifting groceries or opening a can for me or so so simple things. Um, so yeah, we talked about it. We talked about it as a family. We had a family meeting about it and, um, you know, they were pretty young at the time and, but they took it well and it's just been kind of part of their life. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And I think children often want to help. And, you know, I know you're, mm-hmm. you're, you have a background as a teacher. So tell me if I'm wrong, but the younger ones, you know, that the classic thing is, you know, I'll do it myself. Like they don't want to accept help sometimes from us. And then they feel kind of, like you said, empowered if they can mm-hmm. help us as well. Yeah. But as the parent, it can feel a little bit, um, like you said, you know, disappointing or, or awkward to be like, wait, I'm the mom, I'm supposed to help my child, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. But um, once you can get to that acceptance piece, then it becomes a lot, a lot yeah, easier. There's, there's very much an emotional, um, you know, kind of like the, 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 is it the 12 stages of grief or whatever, whatever they say. Yeah. Um, there's stages of, of grief and acceptance when, it, when you get a diagnosis like this. There really is. There's these levels of emotions that you have to allow yourself to pass through in order to get to the point where everything's going to, you're going to be okay regardless of how you're choosing to manage your disease, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And do you have any just advice to people who, young people who have rheumatoid arthritis, maybe who either don't have children yet and want to have children, but are like a little fearful about that or people who already have children and are just struggling managing? Those are two different questions, but yeah. So I had, because I didn't get my diagnosis until after I had kids. Um, I have a little bit of a different, you know, perspective, I guess. Um, I did have infertility issues, significant infertility issues before I had my first though. So I understand that emotional roller coaster that comes with wanting to be pregnant so desperately and then not having it happen or, you know, all the nuances that come with that. And, but I would say, you know, I think, I think stress is a huge factor with, with, um, wanting to be pregnant and allowing yourself to, um, really believe that it's going to happen when it's supposed to happen. If it will, if it's going to happen, you know, I had to really release control of that in a way you know, cause you can do all the things you can, you know, I charted my basal body temperature for a year and a half, you know, every single morning for a year and a half, um, wanting to get pregnant and doing all the things and meeting with the infertility doctors. And, and so I get it. I understand that. Um, and it can be really hard. And so I just want to acknowledge the difficulty in that. And I want to tell you that whatever emotions you're feeling, whether it's you're trying to get pregnant right now, or you've suffered miscarriages because I've, I've been through that as well, that um, it is so important, number one, to communicate with your partner because I, you know, through that experience, I was holding some stuff back and that really did affect our relationship and his understanding of what I needed at the time. Um, but so I, I can't really speak to, you know, as far as like, you know, what you should do to get your body ready with autoimmune illness, because I was diagnosed after. Now, I I definitely had things leading up to that, though, that that affected my fertility and whatnot. But in in terms of moms of young kids, I could definitely speak into that. Because after my diagnosis, I mean, our life really had to change some, you know, we had to slow life had to slow down a little bit. Uh, And that was really something that, you know, my kids were 
were brought along through that process. And so for me, now we, you know, because RA has certain elements to it that kind of affect the cadence of our days. And so like morning stiffness is a factor and kids, you know, they're bright eyed and bushy tailed right away in the morning. And so for us, we've had to kind of modify our schedule a little bit. So my kids know that like they have a morning routine where they get up and they, they're self-sufficient in the morning. And I, I tend to wake up after them. And so they do their first breakfast and then we do second breakfast where I can make them their pancakes and their sausage and all the stuff that they want. Um, and so, and then we homeschool. So we actually don't do any school, any formal school until the afternoon, because then I'm able to wake up and get around and get my body moving and do all of my self-care practices that I need to do to be successful in my days, get my stuff done. And then we can, and then I'm ready to tackle what I need to tackle with them homeschool wise. And that has really worked out well for us. And that's just the cadence of our family. So maybe the cadence of your family just has to change. You really just need to kind of hone into that and figure out what works for you. Um, obviously, you know, we have a different situation because I do homeschool. So because of that, our schedule is more lenient and more flexible, which I need. And so that's just kind of, you know, how it's worked out for us. So, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. It's a great example of like scheduling it to the best of your ability, scheduling your daily routines around your symptoms and your own rhythms. So I think that's, I think that's wonderful. So Renee, I've heard you speak in the past about how your Christianity and your faith has helped you on your journey with rheumatoid arthritis. And I would love to give you a chance to, to um, share with the audience a little about that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for giving me that opportunity, Cheryl. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, as for anyone that follows me on Instagram, they know that I'm very open with my faith. It is an integral part of my life. And, and that is absolutely true going right into my RA diagnosis. You know, I tend to see the world through that lens. Um, and I honestly really do depend on, on my faith for every aspect of my life. And so that same thing rung true with my RA. And so I just, I have a lot of scriptures that I use in my Bible to refer back to when I need it, you know, when I need that reminder of the hope that I have um, in Jesus and the, the fact that I, I do, I'm not living just for this life, but another one as well for an eternal life. And so for me, um, I like to remind myself of that on a regular basis, um, because there is kind of this, um, th there's a sadness, um, with this, with this disease or with any disease really. And so that kind of keeps my, um, that kind of keeps me feeling hopeful feeling gratitude that, you know, there are plenty of other people in this world that have it way, way worse than I do. And that I can still live a wonderful full life and still have joy and still have gratitude and still have peace and draw my strength from that. And so, um, yeah, that's absolutely a vital for me. And I honestly, I don't know how I would navigate this disease without my faith. So, yeah. And I, I am just, I can't believe it hasn't come up in the podcast yet. We're on episode 33 and this is the first time, but I know so many people use, um, not, I don't want to say, I shouldn't say use their faith, but you sure. know, they find that, um, hope and encouragement in their faith. And actually yeah, I'm personally more on the agnostic slash atheist side of things, but mm -hmm. I grew up non-denominational Christian. And I think that, um, that one of the things that did resonate with, with me about that, that I've carried through now is, you know, the idea of unconditional love and that everyone is worthy of unconditional love, regardless of your disability, regardless of, you know, um, you know, your, your race or anything, you know, that we all deserve unconditional love. And I think that, that you, seeing yourself as a whole person worthy of love rather than, oh, I'm broken because of my rheumatoid arthritis. On the days that I feel like I can't get out of bed or I feel that you know, dread, I can, I can pull, I can pull up those certain scriptures that I have that just give me that shot in the arm that tell me I'm going to be okay. Everything's all right. And let's do this. And so that really helps me. So, um, that's, 
it's, it's just something that it was a very natural thing for me to look to God for my strength when it came to getting diagnosed in 2017. Is there anything else you wanted to say about your faith while we are on that topic? No, other than, um, you know, for the people that might not be feeling very hopeful, that there can be hope that, um, that you can find. So there is always yeah. hope. Yeah, I, lo- I love that. And another kind of, I guess I would say, hot button issue potentially that I know you and I have talked about before is, yeah. you know, just like with religion, people can find comfort and hope in different paths, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, the, you know, we also have different treatment paths that people feel very passionate about <laughs> that, you know, I loved a post that you had, and I will link to this in the show notes, a post where you said, you know, um, if you use medication, and it works for you, good for you, that, you know, you deserve respect. If you use a blend of Western and alternative or integrative approaches, good for you. If you don't use medication and you do a natural approach, good for you. We can res- support and respect everyone. So I would love to give you a chance to share a little bit. What, what inspired that post? Well, um, soon after my diagnosis, I, I started jumping into Facebook groups for RA, whether it was, you know, just female only or everyone. And I, and I started exploring like, what is, you know, what are people with RA doing? And so for me, I decided right away not to, because I was told by my doctor, by my rheumatologist, we need to start you on an aggressive medication regimen right away. And if we don't, you're, there's no cure and you're going to be deformed really quickly. And there's no hope for you unless you start medication. And there was just something inside me that says, that said that I need to put a pause on that for now. And I want to try to exhaust all of my natural options first before going on the medication route. And that was just for me. I grew up in a very natural, crunchy, healthy, green, organic, everything made from scratch home. And it was just kind of ingrained in my brain from a very young age. Um, And so for me, I started exploring diet and lifestyle changes from the get-go. And I was working with my functional medicine doctor in exploring my root causes and figuring some of that out. And so I wanted to focus on my, on getting down to the root of what, what was causing my RA. And so that's when I started with diet change and things like that. But there can be another side to that coin as well, because uh, I almost developed um, a fear of food because I did do an elimination diet and I did discover some of my food triggers. And because of that, I almost became so fearful of food that I, I almost started developing some orthorexic tendencies. And so that's, that's one side of the thing of the coin that really made me not be leery of, of certain diets and fads, but in a way you have to make sure that you are doing it in a smart way. I guess you can't just say, well, I'm going to go all in this diet and then not be under any guidance or direction. You know, I always talk about having a a well-rounded healthcare team. And for me, that's my primary care physician. That's my rheumatologist. That's my functional medicine doctor. You know, that's, that's a variety of people in my life that are helping me make these decisions. It's not just me. It's, it's, it's a shared decision making process. And so going back to that, I decided not to do medication and focus on my root causes. And also I was able to feel the, feel the effects of that right away. Since my diagnosis, I have, I've decided not to take any RA medication and the life I have now is significantly different and more improved from the life that I had pre-diagnosis. So there is something to be said about diet and nutrition and lifestyle changes and focusing on those root causes. And I'm, I'm living proof of that really. Now, that being said though, you know, everyone's got their differing forms of severity. And there are some people that absolutely need to go on medication right away. Yep, exactly. And I will never, ever fault anyone for having to go that route right away, because for them, it might be a life or death situation, you know, or it might be, uh, you know, where people are like, you know, I get DMs all the time on Instagram saying, you know, I tried the diet thing. I tried the lifestyle thing and I am 
it's like, it's bad. It's bad. And so for those people, absolutely. There is a time and a place for medication. Um, you know, and so I don't fault them at all for that. And I just think that sometimes there doesn't have to be an all or nothing mentality. You know, there's no perfect way to, to treat this disease. There's no perfect diet. There's no one size fits all, um, perfect plan, protocol, you know, anything there's, everyone is different. We are all, you know, bio individuals, our bodies absorb things differently and react differently. And we all have different reasons why this RA happened to us. And so those are the things that I want to be respectful about. I want to be reminding people that just because you choose to treat your RA different than me doesn't mean we can't coexist, be friends, be kind, be respectful, you know, and we can have a difference of opinions, but still be nice. You know what I'm saying? Oh, totally. And I think there, there's a nuance to what you're saying that I almost think um, that's just cannot be stressed enough, which is that, you know, the black, any black and white statements to say that all patients need to take like I'm on three different medications for RA. I feel no shame about that. I feel actually immense gratitude to have those options that weren't medications that weren't available 20 or 30 years ago, you know, that helped slow down my disease. But like, I would never say, oh, because I'm on three medications and they're working for me, everyone else needs to be on three. Like, it doesn't make any sense at all. Like, this is my, like you said, individual body. And, you know, in your case, like you are proof that, some people can manage their rheumatoid arthritis naturally, but that doesn't mean that everyone can, or that it's the best medical decision for everyone. I think that we need as patients, it's really important to differentiate between sharing our experiences and then making the leap that because it worked for me, it a hundred percent will work for you. It's more like we have to hedge our bets a little bit and say like, because, you know, natural methods worked for me, they might work for you. If your doctor says there's no way that diet will ever help your RA, that's too much of a black and white statement too. Right. So, um, so, you know, I will say just for the record, because it's important to me to, to point to the evidence that, you know, the reason that so many rheumatologists suggest early and aggressive medication therapy is that the overall at like the population level of the population of people with rheumatoid arthritis, numerous studies show that that is the most likely on the population level to slow down your disease. So for me, it's just focusing on an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, you know, whether that's the food that I'm eating, the products I'm using or the consuming or my environment that I'm in, I'm trying to lower my toxic load. And I'm trying to just be mindful of the things around me that I'm putting on my body in my body, you know, things like that. And it's just those little lifestyle changes that can make a big difference, even for people that are on medication. My whole thing is whatever path you choose, it's not that there's no wrong path, you know, and that was really in 2018, Um, I decided, I decided to start my own RA support group on Facebook because I was in these groups, Cheryl, and I will tell you the amount of negativity and the amount of um, just unkind words that were used. It was just, um, it was really disheartening to me. And, you know, I always tell my kids going back to being a mom, I said, we can use our words as swords or we can use our words as gifts. And it's something that's really important that I teach my kids. And it's also something important that I try to model and live out myself. And so for me, starting this group, I, you know, the, the rheumatoid arthritis mama sisterhood on, on Facebook, um, it was, it was important for me to set the, the, you know, the tone right away to say, I don't care how you're choosing to medicate. I want you to know that this is a safe place that you can share and that you don't have to feel judged and that, you know, and, and I have, to, you know, it's hard, you know, cause the more you grow the, you know, the more reminders you have to give in groups like this. And so we're almost, we're almost to 2000 people in the group. And, um, it's just been, it's been a really good, it's been really good for me to see that. Okay. There, there are, you know, still people wanting to put in the effort to be, to be kind and to not be judgmental. And so, I mean, even you and I, Cheryl, 
right now. I mean, we're on totally opposite ends of the spectrum. And here we are having this wonderful conversation. And, um, and it, it's, it's possible. And we're, we're friends. And it's, and it's yeah. a wonderful thing. To- totally. And I think um, I had Dr. Kara Ke- Wada on a couple of yes. episodes ago, and she goes by like the crunchy allergist. Yeah. And I love how she says, you know, it's not an either we I want to focus on an and approach, not an either or like, and so I've done a lot of work on sharing my journey, feeling not ashamed of being on medication because of some of the there's a negativity that can go both ways. There's the anti-medication people. And then there's the pro, you know, medication. So I'll just share my, I share my story and say, you know, like, I don't feel like I failed to do things naturally because I was put on this medication and because it works for me. I, again, I feel just, I feel gratitude for it. And I also can do lifestyle things like, you know, avoiding triggers for inflammation for me, some, and and it's all individual, right? Like gluten, I cut out gluten over a decade ago, and it hasn't made a difference to my sensation of my symptoms for rheumatoid arthritis, but it's helped my stomach significantly. And so I feel an overall more comfort in my life because I'm not bloated all the time. I knowing that, okay, there's choices I can make exercise is a big one for me for fatigue and pain. Um, it helps so much to get moving and for my emotional well being. So thinking that of not an either or, and not an us versus them, but you know, at the end of the day, like I, I I'm an extrovert. I love people, right? I love, I love everyone. And so for me, I'm like, Hey, you're doing well on whatever's working for you. You're on vegan and you're doing amazing and you don't take any medications. That's so like, I'm not, that's amazing. Like I want people to all feel good and not feel like this disease is taking them down. So, you know, who am I to say, because I'm on medication that everyone else needs to be on medication. No, I just, if you get where you want to go, which is like a happy full life with rheumatoid arthritis. However you get there, as long as you're not hurting anyone, that's amazing, right? Exactly. And I think it's so important to um, acknowledge the fact that we are all individuals, you know, and that's just the simple truth of it. And these, you know, there's certain people that can eat meat and there's certain people that can't, you know, and there's certain people, you know, the food thing is really, um, is really on the forefront of my mind right now because my body really does ebb and flow based on the foods that I eat, but it can, you, there's a dark side to it too. Like I mentioned when, when I was, you know, developing those orthorexic tendencies and, you know, you can really develop a fear of food and I was losing a ton of weight and I didn't have a lot of weight to lose, but I was losing a ton of weight. And so you can almost, um, you know, if you're not under the guidance of, of, of certain doctors, um, then you can, you can really, you know, damage yourself further. And, you know, there, everyone is just doing this whole trial and error thing. You know, yeah. they're just trying to figure out what is, what works well for them, you know? Yeah. And I think just for the audience members who might not have heard of orthorexia before, it's like a relatively newer term. It's sure. an obs- obsessive pattern with healthy eating is yes. that's what I'm finding on, on online. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's almost like you, be- you become so obsessed with eating healthy, with avoiding certain foods that you're almost, you can put yourself into a state of nutrient depletion because you're avoiding certain foods. And so yeah. that's, you know, I- it started happening to me because I was too fearful. It's so common. I know that um, I had on the podcast earlier, Christina Montoya and Jennifer Therani, who are both registered dietitians, and Kia, who's studying to become a registered dietitian. And they both, um, or all three of them were, were talking about how it's a very common um, stage for people to go through who are trying to manage their autoimmune diseases through diet, because we want something we can control right? Like there's so in our, it feels like it's out of our control that our body is just kind of like attacking our healthy joints. And so we learn, wait, some of the foods that you're eating might help you control that inflammation. Um, some people it's, it's a good thing to learn about your own inflammation triggers through food, but it then if you take it to an extreme, it's mm-hmm. like you said, it can become an obsession. And then of course, obsessions and OCD is an anxiety based disorder and anxiety gets your brain and your body into fight or flight, which is stress, which is not good for inflammation either. Right. Exactly. And, you know, I, 
keeping a food journal for me is super important, you know, just tracking how I'm feeling with certain foods, you know, tracking what makes me feel like junk, what makes me feel good, what gives me energy, what, you know, makes my joints hurt. And so some people can eat whole grains and some people can't, some people can eat, you know, beans and legumes and uh, certain seeds and nuts. And some people can't, I always say I'm, I'm an expert on my own experience. We are all experts on our own experience, but we cannot, and we, and, and we do each other a disservice when we project onto others. We, we constantly say, well, this worked for me, so it's blanket and gonna work for everybody. That's short-sighted in my opinion. That's a really beautiful way to put it. Um, I had Julie on last week and she shared a couple of her food triggers. And so knowing that everyone's different, Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure some people will still want to know, would you mind sharing, like, what are some of the worst foods for you, like that you avoid or what are some of the best Um, foods that are anti-inflammatory for you? Yeah, sure. So for me, I actually don't have a sensitivity to gluten for me, dairy and sugar processed foods. And I don't have a gallbladder either. So like overly greasy foods or overly fatty foods, I've got to make sure that I take my digestive enzymes. Um, you know, and that makes me unique because how I digest fats is different than someone else. Um, and so, and I can't eat like kidney beans. I can eat black beans, but I can't eat kidney beans like in chili, you know? So it's like those little nuances. Um, and if I, if I, yeah, it's just those certain things. You know, it's just avoiding for me. I do, I do t- try to avoid gluten for the most part, but if it sneaks in here and there, it's not like an, an end game type situation for me. Like some people, if they have even a little bit, it affects them. But for me, you know, I can get away with that, but everything in moderation, you know, I, I tend to think of life in happy mediums because when we veer one way too far or the other way too far, that's when, that's when the problems arise. And so for me, I, I can't, I don't completely avoid gluten. I don't completely avoid dairy. I don't completely avoid sugar, Cheryl. And I, I still eat some processed foods because I want to live my life and enjoy my life, you know? And so for me, it's just, it's a balance. And I Mm want to, and I, you know, I've been doing a lot of work over the last year of, um, healing myself of some of the, um, negative thoughts that I've had around food. And it doesn't have to be an all or nothing for me. Now, some people, they have to avoid everything um, all the time. But for me, when, I, when we're at the, you know, we, were, we just came back from Florida uh, on a family vacation and I felt great down there. I mean, I, my body loves the heat and the humidity and it loves the warmer temperatures. And when I'm feeling really good, I can get away with, you know, being a little bit more lenient here and there with food. Um, And so everybody's different, but some people have to be super strict and that's okay too. How have you come out of the orthorexia? Like what, what helped you get a move away from that? Did you read a book or did you go to therapy? How did that Um, work? uh, Actually, I was introduced to a incredible resource. Um, She is like a food freedom coach. Her name's Elizabeth Dahl from a woman of wellness. And she would actually probably be someone great to have on the podcast for you because she has actually helped me a lot with under with um, creating a healthy relationship with food because I really did have kind of an un I created kind of almost inside of myself an unhealthy relationship with food that it was like um, food was out to get me or food was making me sick. And that is true for a lot of people. And that's true for me in certain cases. I mean, I can't eat, I don't just drink a big glass of milk, but if dairy happens to be an ingredient in something, I'm not gonna freak out. Or if, you know, I can, I can have a little bit of sugar, you know, and, it's, and, and she helped me to create this healthy relationship with food. I took, you know, I took her course and I, you know, she has a podcast as well. And she's just been really helpful for me personally in that respect. I'm so glad that that resource exists and I will, I'll put her information in the show notes. I think that there definitely can be a kind of perfectionistic streak in the wellness culture, for lack of better word, this idea that everything that you do has to be perfectly clean and perfectly toxin free. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say I have to eat only perfect foods and feel really, really perfect all the time because perfection doesn't really exist. Right. 
Exactly. And so for me, I have, I've had to release the chains of food being the enemy. And that for me has been a huge part of also the emotional, um, the emotional stress of eating because it can, stress is a huge factor when you have autoimmune disease. And I was noticing that food was giving me anxiety. Food was causing fear and stress. And I had to recreate my relationship with food and remind myself that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I can live a full, vibrant, happy, grateful, joyful, peaceful life and still have a little bit of sugar <laughs> and have a little bit of dairy once in a while and everything's going to be okay, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's so powerful. I'm so glad you share that. I know for sure there are multiple people listening and who can just really, really relate to that. So mm-hmm. that's so helpful. now if I eat too much of anything, you know, too much of a good thing is never a good thing. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I can't sit there and eat an ice cream cone every single day. I can't eat, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm very careful about what I eat, but I'm not militant about it, you know, mm-hmm. and I go out with my girlfriends and I might have a glass of wine, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I might go out and to dinner and I might have something with some, you know, uh, uh, something on the no, no list. Mm-hmm. And so for some people that's not okay. And I'm not projecting myself onto others because for some people, they have to draw a hard line. I don't have GI issues other than not having a gallbladder. I have a pretty tough stomach, you know, Um, but that's not the case for everybody. But, you know, you just have to, like I said earlier, become an expert on yourself and just do your best. And, And when you're talking to other people about their choices, just be kind and be respectful. There was like a little saying I saw somewhere that was like, you know, good for you, not for me kind of thing. Like something that might be good for you it isn't either isn't what I'm interested in or isn't what's going to work for me, but I can still be um, happy for you, right? I can be happy for somebody um, even if what they're experiencing isn't what helped me. Uh, so yeah, I hear this all the time that there's not only a problem in Facebook groups of negativity um, towards people who choose different paths, but there's also a lot of fear on the groups. And, and it, I think there's a place, a time and place. And again, I, I want to respect everyone's needs. Like some people just need a safe space to vent and say like, no one in my family understands me. And that might be their reality. They might have an unsupportive spouse or a job that's not giving them an accommodation. And they shouldn't have to be like, oh, you just like need to stop saying that and be positive. Like there should be a safe space. But the Facebook groups can become, if you're not careful, an echo chamber of people just venting and without kind of like any productive um, element to it. And so I, there's a group and actually I'm having her on, um, Mariah Leach from mama's facing forward, which is, do you, yeah, yeah. She's awesome too. So she started, her. yeah, similar thing. She started a group, just like you saying, you know, like we, and she has one vent thread a week. I'm in her group and your group, by the way. Yeah. yeah I just found her. I, I never knew she existed until just a few months ago. She has a thread once a week. It's called the vent thread. And like, this is where it's a conversation. You just get it all out in that thread. And then the rest of the group is about like, quote unquote, you know, facing forward or like in your group, it's about, you know, the sisterhood and like that we are all, we can all be united and support each other, even if we're experiencing different things. And it's just, I'm like literally getting chills just thinking about these, how important these spaces are. Um, and, and how they can give, like you mentioned, hope earlier to, to tie that thread back, you know, to give people hope. And I hear people tell me a lot like, oh, I, I just I just got my diagnosis and it's just it gives me hope to just see someone, even if I'm just posting a video doing something very random, like I'm dancing and like pointing to a word about, you know, these are like some of my life hacks for rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, who's going to watch this? But then people are like, oh, I, it, it gives me hope to just see you showing that that you're just living yeah. your life. I mean, I'm sure you get those messages, too, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the majority of the people, the majority of the women, because it is a women only group uh, by design, but the majority of the women that are joining are typically ones that are newly diagnosed and just looking for support, looking for encouragement, looking for answers, resources. And absolutely. I mean, I remember it's a scary feeling and it's unnerving and you, you know, 
there's a lot of emotions. And so if I can just help people navigate that a little bit easier in a, in a non-judgmental safe space, then I want to do that. Um, now I do have to be careful about, you know, if there, if there is certain, because there's certain people that can sneak in that can kind of bring things down. And so I, you know, I am in there every single day in my group monitoring, you know, and one of my rules is you got to be kind and encouraging and helpful and uplifting. And if you're not going to be that, then you need to find somewhere else to share. So yeah, I think it's just, I, you know, I am very active in the group. I am there just to, you know, make sure things stay in line with the original purpose and intent of the group. If you're in a Facebook group that you feel doesn't fit your needs, then look around and try to find, there are other options. They're not yeah, all and my group might not be for everybody for that mm-hmm, exact reason. Mm-hmm. Some people, you know, some people need to get through those negative emotions and process those negative emotions or, you know, and it's part of the process and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Okay. Absolutely. And I want to just start wrapping up a little bit. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to touch upon or share with the audience that you haven't had a chance to say yet? I think for me, for anyone that might be, you know, new to my content or new to who I am, I think I really want people to understand that I am, I'm a, I just want people to know that I'm a corner of the internet that is Um, a safe place for people to come to if you're fearful or if you're scared. Um, You know, I am not a medical doctor, but I love supporting people through the emotional piece of rheumatoid arthritis, whether it's just needing someone to share, needing a listening ear, needing someone to um, remind them that everything's going to be okay. Um, I've been told I'm a good listener. And so for anyone that, you know, maybe just needs someone to, um, doesn't have anyone in their life to, to share this with because they don't understand, they can absolutely reach out to me at any time. And I would love to just get in the mud puddle with them. And, um, you know, so I, I I just want to be available for people in any way that I can, because I remember I started my Instagram account as a journal of sorts when I was first diagnosed, because like I said earlier, I didn't know anyone with RA and I just, I started a journal and I just started kind of documenting my, my story and now it turned into what it turned into. So instead of me looking for the support, now I'm using what I've learned to support others. And I think there's a beautiful give and take, um, with, with that. And there's a, there's a definite learning curve with it. And I just want to help in any way I can. And, and this is one way that I've found that I can help people. It's wonderful. And you are a good listener. That's, you know, you might want to consider having your own podcast someday. So we'll, oh, we'll, we'll have, I might have to follow up with you about that. So um, as you mentioned this wonderful community, can you remind the audience where they can find your Facebook group and where they can find you on Instagram? Absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram at the rheumatoid arthritis mama. Um, and I'm also on Facebook under the same name. And my Facebook support group is the rheumatoid arthritis mama's sisterhood. And you can just search for it in, in Facebook, or you can go to the link in my bio on Instagram. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I know with three kids, you are very busy. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time today. Absolutely, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having me.